The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. If the crime is homicide, three factors are involved in its solution. The corpse, or the victim, the perpetrator, or the murderer, and the investigation, or the detectives involved in it. In this case, there are Captain Ben Trock and Detective Henrico Alvira. The victim, in a sense, we know. His body is there, but his identity is a question mark. The murderer, of course, we do not know until we have traced a strange journey back through time to a dreadful secret hidden in the past. Our mystery drama, Dead Men Do Tell Tales, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Mason Adams. I'll be back shortly with Act One. This is a story told by a man who is already dead. You'll have to accept that fact since none of us can really change it. He is a haunted man, haunted by some dreadful memory we can't imagine yet which accounts for the fact that he is restless and will not stay decently quiet in the grave. Possibly it has something to do with the manner of his going. Possibly we will find out the whole story if we just listen to him, as we are about to do now. The winds were blowing to rattle the teeth that night. And in my fender mirror, I could see him dancing in the breeze as if he had no care in the world. They ordered me to pull the truck away, and I obeyed. But shamed so hot it burned my whole body. Jim Young's head was cocked to one side, as if to say, Why me? And how could you do it? And I wanted to scream out the answer. It was none of my doing. It wasn't me. But no matter how much I protest, that night rubbed off on me a stain I couldn't wash away. Maybe I couldn't have changed anything then. But now, near 20 years later, I have exacted retribution from all but one. And like everything else, it seems, as always, he's ended up the winner. Hello, Sam. What are you doing here? He gave me a gun. He wanted me to use it. On yourself? I've changed our minds. It's simpler to use it on you. Detective Squad, Sergeant Alvera speaking. Oh, yeah, Pete. Yeah. Okay, on my way. What you got, Rico? Homicide, Captain. No identification. Vagrant? How many vagrants you know wear a money belt with 8,925 bucks, huh? I think I'll check this one out myself. What the doc say? Two shots, Captain. One shattered the, um... What do you call in the front here? Breastbone? No, the doc called it something else. Sternum? That, that's it, yeah, yeah. So I go to the head of the class. Advantages of a college education. That the one that killed him? Yeah. Doc says he must have driven all the pieces of bone like buckshot into the heart. Well, what about the other bullet? Well, it went through him just above the left hip. No damage. Ballistics found the bullet in a chest of drawers. Thirty-eight, probably short barrel. Hmm. Well, at least we know something about the killer. Oh, uh, what? He was no professional. Two shots point blank that far apart... Point blank? Powder burns on his shirt. Oh, of course, yeah. Also, he was uh, no stranger. How do you figure? He opened the door, didn't he? Stepped back to let the guy in. How can you tell that? 
The angle, the way he fell, the uh, bullet that went through him ended up in the front of the bottom drawer of that chest in the drawers. Now, you go to the head of the class. Smart boy, Rico. Well, I learned it all from you. The master detective, Captain Ben Trock. Got the crime solved in a flash. <laughs> now, all we got to do is peg who did it and who it was done to. Let's start with the victim. Who is he? Like I said, no identification. Uh, either he had an any or someone didn't want him to be identified. <laughs> okay, Rico, amigo. Let's start digging. We could begin with the landlady. <laughs> And you didn't hear any shots, Mrs. Klein? Shots? Why would I hear shots from 8 to 3.30 with the volume turned down so I don't have to answer the phone? How was that again, Captain? Her hearing aid. The hard hat's next door tearing down the building. So she can live in peace and quiet. During their working hours, she turns off her hearing aid. So she didn't hear any shots? And no shots. Did you see anyone come into the building this afternoon? Certainly I saw people. Him. Mr. Small. The man who got himself murdered. And my fourth floor back with a toothache and Mrs. Boblinski, she had to walk her dog. And Mrs. Pycrush, she wants her toilet fixed. Uh, and then there was the I, guy I, uh, from... meant like strangers. Oh. Phone man for Mr. Hicksby. Third floor front. He's a new man. Check that, Rico. I got him. And that's all I've seen. From 12 on, I got my soaps. Or what? She follows the daytime television serials. You want to know my favorite? Uh, I'd rather you didn't tell me. I wouldn't want it to spoil the others for me. So his name is, uh, Mr. Small... Any first name? He didn't tell me. You never got around to a first name basis. What? Uh, consider I didn't say it. So you uh, don't know his first name? I didn't say that. <sighs> Excuse me. You do know it? Well, I suppose. Sam. After all, his boss wouldn't know who would. You are so right. Isn't she, Rico? Of course, Captain. And while we're on the subject of names, would you know his boss's name? Yeah, some kind of foreign name, like um, uh, Nettie. Uh, Nettie? Or would you have any idea what kind of business or an address? No, I wrote down the phone number. Would you have it? i give it to Mr. Small. I mean, I think maybe it was an extans exchange. I didn't pay too much, never mind. Oh, yeah, I, I remember he called. It was something to do with when he would have some name or other's car to be ready. Uh, that checks out, Rico. You notice Sam Small's hands? Yes, uh, real well manicured, but... Uh... You could see he was a man who worked with them. The dark shade under the nails and by the cuticles. I figure maybe a mechanic. You better check out all repair shops that might have an Escanza exchange. Or that are run or franchised by a guy named Nettie. Can do. On my way. Hasta luego. Uh, uh, Mrs. Klein, uh, about the visitors. You're sure you haven't forgotten anyone you didn't know that you might have seen in the building? Oh, anybody I see I don't know gets a bum's rush. Careful you think a widow woman's got to be. Uh, very careful, Mrs. Klein. Well, it ain't easy. I mean, for all poor Jake tried to do, God rest his soul, there wouldn't be anyone better. But... Oh, such a good man. I don't know where the world is going now. It's just not the same. I know how you feel. What do people our age know about where the youth is going? <sighs> Let me take your handkerchief and help you over so you could wash your face. Why, a real gentleman. I try to help. Hmm. That's nice. What? Uh, this handkerchief I'm smelling. That's your perfume? Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't know. I, somebody dropped this someplace. I picked it up. It's a beautiful handkerchief. I wonder which one of your tenants dropped it. <laughs> My tenants? A special piece of cambric linen like this. It has a monogram. H-R-M. This might be a piece of evidence. You don't mind if I take this? Well, of course I might. Well, what am I going to do? <laughs> Fight City Hall? Luigi, move. We got to finish. Yeah, what do you want, mister? Your name, Nettie? Yeah, that's me. So, what do you want? The police. Oh, I got enough trouble already. I need you. Now what? You got a guy who works for your name, Sam Small? Sure. Best mechanic I ever had. What happened to him? What do you mean, what happened? Well, Mr. Bemerman, he's waiting for his Mercedes, and Sammy's not here. That figures... You find a master mechanic out of the blue, there's got to be something wrong he comes to work with you. He's dead, Mr. Nettie. Dead? Two bullets in him. What do you know about him? Me? What do I know about anything? You try to run a repair shop? 
Oh, what am I going to do now about Mr. Bemerman and his Mercedes? That's a question you have to answer. I still want to know about this guy Small. Where did he come from and uh, how come you hired him? Well, I got a brother in Fort Berry, Texas. He got a shopper like mine. He write me a letter saying this guy's coming here to San Felipe. He said, Guido, you better grab this paisan. He's one fine mechanic. You don't find no better. So you hired him. Well, sure. When? Oh, two, maybe three months ago. I'm going to want to know all you know about this guy, Sam Small. It ain't much. I'll take anything you got. Uh, you want to go have coffee? No, come by the office. Not so much noise, eh? <laughs> See, eh? One Sunday, I'm all alone here pumping gas. I'm a fit in the car, and uh, the bus goes past. He must have got off, but I don't see him until the car leaves. And he's standing right there with a couple of bags in his hands. Yes, mister. Can I help you? Excuse me, but are you Mr. Guido Basso? Sure, that's me. You have a brother in Port Barry, Texas, named Luigi? Well, sure. What's it to you? I think perhaps he wrote to you about me. My name is Sam Small. Hey, the mechanic. That's my business. Ah, good business for me, too. You are just what I need. Hey, you, you want to start tomorrow? Suit me just fine. Oh, uh, let's go in the office. You give me the social security number and... Uh, here, I take one of your bags. No, I, I can manage. No, 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 no. Let me help. <laughs> hey, hey, Sam. You got a place to stay. Well, not yet. I got plenty of room in my place. Third floor, own apartment. Three rooms, 225 a month. Hey, you, you want to take a look? I reckon I better find my own place. Oh, what's the matter? Too much? I make it to 200 even. Well, it isn't that, Mr. Nettie. It's just that I'm pretty much of a loner. And I have things to do to finish up. It's, it's better that I, uh, I stay to myself. Hey, keep lots of port. What, 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 what happened? Hard to think to make the door close. The spring is too strong. I'm sorry I spilled all your things. I'll get them. Don't, don't you worry. He moves so quick, he pushed me out of the way. But not before I see a gun right there on the ground. So maybe, senior policeman, that means something to you. I never found out why he carried it or anything about him. Except he was one damn fine mechanic. This gun, it was a handgun? See, si, see, si, a, a, a revolver, you call, huh? Something like this? Yeah, yeah, see, si, just like that. You know if he ever carried it? Ah, no. No, you don't know, or no, he didn't? He didn't have it. How can you be sure? Because I ask him not to. I don't like guns. And every day I check. What do you suppose he had a gun for? Oh, such me. I wonder what it was when he could have used it maybe to defend himself. You know if he kept it at his place? No, i never been there. You know the address? Uh, Summer Street, I think. And the phone number, I have that. You've been at the, at the station here all day? I see. How about lunch? Oh, well, I'm out about one hour. Yeah, when? Usual time, 12 to 1. Uh, maybe a little more. I am the boss. You go home? No, I bring him a lunch. Then I go sit in the park where there is a sun. I am alone. No, no, no noise, you know. Yes, I know. Um, it's like the next best thing to an alibi. An alibi? Hey, what are you talking about? You think I killed Sam? I don't know. Did you? No. Why should I? I got no answers. Right now, there ain't anything but questions. A strange and tortuous story as I first suggested to you. Twisting through the labyrinths of the human soul, sneaking and skulking from the bright light of anything, most of all, truth, and adding up at last to a retribution that Our Lady with the Scales may have to wink at behind the bandage over her eyes. I shall return shortly with Act Two. has been done, leaving in its train the five W's. Who, where, 
when, what, and why. Well, so far we know where and what the weapon was and some idea of when. Somewhere between 12 and 1 p.m., according to the medical examiner. Now there remains the double question, who and why. For the moment, our investigators, Detective Sergeant Alvira and Captain Trock, are concerned with the who. Where are we headed, Captain? I don't know about you, Rico. Me, precinct, report, and home to dinner. What about the case? What about it? Not much more we can do till tomorrow. Uh, You figured the landlady or the guy who runs the service station? You don't count anybody out. I like the lead I got here best. What? The little square of white linen. The handkerchief? That's it. Whoever dropped anything this fancy didn't belong in that crummy house except for a special reason. I'm just glad they left their calling card. How are you going to trace them? Through the, um, what you call that thing? The The monogram. We have his initials. These are hand-embroidered, custom-made handkerchiefs. Probably all his haberdashery is shorts, shirts, ties. That means special orders. Shouldn't be too hard to trace. And the clincher could be the perfume. Perfume? Here. Smell. Yeah, yeah. High and fancy. That's no toilet water. Straight essence. Like $50 an ounce. I see what you mean. The sombre didn't belong in that punk neighborhood. Expensive taste. What was he doing there? What was a grease monkey who travels light doing with all that dough in a money belt? Blackmail? It's hmm, one answer. It's one game where you always take the chance of ending up with your head in a basket. Uh, okay, Captain. You check out the perpetrator and I'll concentrate on the victim. I got a hunch finding out who isn't going to be the answer in this case. It's going to be why. So? So if my guy with the expensive taste is the culprit, he's a boy with clout and connections. We're going to need a real strong case to pin anything on him. Just keep your fingers crossed that we can dig up anything that good. I wanted to call out from the grave and tell him the truth. You know? No, how could you know? Are there any others of you who have died before their time? who hang in this half-world between heaven and hell, lost among the stars, waiting for some final act of justice you left undone, like me, Sam Small, or waiting and praying that two hard-working detectives can finish the job you left behind? How could I have failed at the last? He should have been the easiest of all. Remember back to how it all began. I just don't understand you, Sam Small. What do you mean, pick up stakes and leave board? Just what I said, Beth Ann. But what for? You'll just begin to do real fine. And Chrissy's starting high school. (laughs) She'll be graduated by 1964, and she'll want to be among her friends. I know. I'm asking a lot of my wife and my daughter. But I wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't a thing that... Well, I felt I had to ask. But what's suddenly the matter with Borden? We're both born, brought up right here. We've always loved it. And each other. What has changed everything all of a sudden? It... Borden has changed, Beth Ann. People change. Time to move. I declare I don't know what's gotten into you. Nothing has changed about Borden. Uh, a lot of, lot of unrest here now, Beth Ann. Oh, you mean Governor Fulbers, all that fussing about whether a Negro has a right to a decent education? Sort of. What, Sam? That is nothing to run scared about. That's been coming for years. Why, you ought to take an example from Henry Martin, some of your friends and neighbors, about how to make peace and bring harmony. Henry Martin? And my other friends? Well, yes. Well, people like Alan Porter and Jacob Bett and Fred LeMay and all. You think these men have any conscience about the black man? Yes, I think in the past months they've seen the light. Seen the light? (laughs) Well, you don't talk to any of them. At least they're out doing something about things in the world. That's more than I can say about you. (laughs) Between your working at your old gas station, shining up your old cars, you don't seem to have time for anything, including me and Chrissy. I've got a lot on my mind, Beth. And I'm begging you to listen to me. 
And it won't be off of my mind till I get away from Borden for good. But what makes you think any town be better than your own home one? I swear, Sam Small, you ain't been the same man since the night of Magnolia Griffith's marriage. Where'd you disappear to that night anyways? I can't tell you. Well, are you ashamed of something? Supposing I was. It wouldn't have to do with Carrie Sue Griffiths. What do you mean? That little tramp, Magnolia's sister. Oh, I wouldn't put anything past her. You know, there are a lot of rumors about that party after the wedding, and the Lord knows almost anything could be true. The way all of you boys, married and otherwise, used to look at her with your eyes. Beth, for heaven's sake, I wasn't even at the wedding. You know I was working late at the station that night. Hmm. You said you were. I wouldn't lie to you. All right, then. Tell me the truth about why you want to leave Borden. I can't. That's not good enough. It's going to have to be. Because I'm telling you, Beth, if I'm ever to lift up my head again, we've got to go. All right. Because I'm your wife and I love you, I'll go with you. But whatever it is, Sam, I'm going to tell you something what my pappy would have said. You've got to face down things. You've got something riding on your back. Don't do no good to run. It'll just keep traveling along right with you. I should have listened to her. But how could I, running as scared as I was? Somehow, after Borden, nothing was the same. And I didn't blame Beth when she finally asked for the divorce. By that time, I'd bought the first of the guns. And I was in Chaparral, Texas. And that's where I met up with Jacob Vetter. And the whole idea came to me. How I could cleanse my soul. Jake! Jake Vetter. Why, uh, Sam. Sam Small, what are you doing here? I live here. Anyways, I work here. You? Oh, just moving some. Ain't heard hiding a hair of you since you pulled up stakes from Borden. I've done a power of traveling. Seems like a lot of us have. What do you mean? Well, Porter, Sam Palerno, Fred LeMay, Arnie Jensen, Doug McFarlane. Pretty near all of us who, well, you know, all of us who were there that night. How about Henry? Well, now, Henry, he was still around when I pulled up stakes. I'd have thought you knew that. How come? Well, after you and your missus broke up, uh, she come back on home to Borden and... Henry and she... Well, you trying to tell me they're married? You didn't know? No. Oh, damn me for a sinner every which way I turn. Oh, take it so much to heart, you got dealt the roughest hand. I tell you, Sam, if I had it to... What's that you got there? A gun. 38 short barrel. You want to take a man out, this would be just the handiest little weapon you could have close up. Especially if the man was yourself. What you got in mind, Sam? Blowing my brains out. That is until you showed up. Sam, you're not going to kill me. No, sir, Jake. No, sir, I'm not. Till you showed up, it was me I figured to do away with. But of a sudden, I got to thinking. There's a heavy burden bearing on all our minds. And we ain't never going to live at peace with it. There's only one way for all of us that were there that night. To find peace in our souls and a life hereafter. Wow. You brought me a kind of call, Jake. Now I know where the rest of my life is at. Here. What? I don't want no gun. They that live by the sword shall die by it. The only way you'll ever put your conscience to rest. It took Jake pretty near three weeks to make up his mind. Or for me to make it up for him. But I raised the sight of Jim Young so clear in his mind, it haunted him night and day till the only way to get peace was... He used the gun I gave him. And that's what moved me on to the next step. I counted up how many were there that night and how many I could figure out were still left. I figured that till all of them were gone, the ghost would never be laid to rest. 
I bought me five short-barreled 38s. And I started out on a journey to pass them out to be used. A journey that took me 12 years right up to the day before yesterday. And my death. Morning, Captain. Morning, Rico. Sorry I'm late. Anything new on the Sam Small homicide? A mm, couple of things. Did you get a make on who owned the handkerchief yet? Yeah, I found out the manufacturer. They keep a list of their monogram customers. I'm waiting to get a rundown on who HRM is and how many of them there are. Now, what have you got? A uh, bunch of stuff. I just don't know what it adds up to. Here's the file. Let's lug it into my office and get away from this racket. Well, like I told you, I had the hunch the guy might have had military service. Through his fingerprints, I dug up his record. No doubt he is Sam Small. We knew that within 36 hours after we found him. I dug a couple of other things out of the record, too. He was married and divorced, had one kid. What happened to his wife? I'm still digging on that. I'm waiting for a telex from Borden. Where? Borden, Mississippi, where Sam Small comes from. Born there. He's come a far piece since then. Uh, you should know how far. Up till now, I traced him to four other towns besides this. Not to mention his service in Korea. This man has done some traveling. Any notion why he cleared out of these other bergs? Mm, Kien Sabe. Except that my hunch is it has to do with these. What are they? Newspaper clippings. Found them in an envelope inside the dresser. When the killer ransacked it, they must have caught in the back of the drawer and fallen behind. Hmm. Santa Pina record, June 14th, 1968. New Mexico mourns. Judge Douglas McFarlane commits suicide. Muscatine Graphic, 8 February 1970. Business executive a suicide. Fred LeMay, president of Oklahoma Security and Homeowners, died this morning from a gunshot wound. <laughs> okay. Other towns, other dates, other men. Suicides, apparently. So what? You notice the weapon used in each case? Yeah. A short barrel, 38. What does that prove? Why would he save these clippings, huh? Here. One is even a bum, this uh, Jake Vetter in Chaparral, Texas. Hmm. Where would he get a gun? You figure Small would have any other connection with them besides saving the clippings? I don't know. I'm working on that. Uh, yeah. Oh, sure. Put him on. It's my guy calling from County Arras about the handkerchief. Uh, yes, hello. All right, this is Captain Truck speaking. You did? That's fine. That many? Oh, from all over the country. I see. Are there any from right here? There is one. Good. May I have his name and address, please? Henry Roberts Martin. No, that's all right. I don't need the address. I know it. Yes. Yes, thanks. I'll arrange for someone to pick up the list and have it telexed onto me. But thank you. Yeah. Looks like maybe you caught yourself a murderer. It looks like I caught myself a bull by the tail. You know who Henry Roberts Martin is? Hey, you... You don't mean the police commissioner himself? And the candidate for the next governor of this state. Oh, man, you don't have that Toro by the tail. He's just about ready to run up your nose. The immortal Mr. Sullivan of Gilbert and Sullivan fame, at a point in the Mikado, when the plot is incredibly complicated, has his principal sing a trio in which each laments in turn, here's a how-de-do, here's a pretty mess, and here's a state of things. I suppose our American equivalent at this given moment in our story would be, where do we go from here? I shall return shortly with Act Three. Captain Ben Trock is holding a very hot potato, and he knows it. The homicide of an obscure citizen with no apparent surviving family has slowly evolved into a nightmare. 
If the who in our famous five of W's is really the police commissioner and a candidate for governor of the state, what on earth is the why? What link buried deep in the past could tie the victim to this prominent and respected man? Well, the easiest way to find out is to continue our strange and twisted story. What am I going to do now? <sighs> Got to be a mistake somewhere. Maybe someone else dropped it. Well, who would have the commissioner's handkerchief? His wife? <sighs> Why would she... Have... Look, you would know better than me, Ben. You've been around him and his family, but that perfume... Well, what about it? Well, it's not very macho when you think of it. More like a woman's. Maybe. You know what kind of perfume Mrs. Martin wears? Well, offhand I don't. But maybe I can find out. No way out of it. I'm going to have to ask the commissioner a couple of questions. From the solid walls of my grave, I want to cry out in despair. I wanted only to bring justice to the guilty. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. How could I know it might reach out to the innocent? And of all people, who was more innocent than Beth Ann, who once had been my wife and all my living days was my love? She had been destroyed enough by the guilt of the past. How could I have brought the present down in ruins about her head as well? I remembered how secure I thought I was in that planned meeting in the park. Oh, Lord. So hard to think it was less than a month ago. Sam. You here? Are you alone? Well, can't you see? I don't trust you. No more than I do you. But we got a little choice, have we? You, less than I. Come here, out of the light, into the bushes. Uh, how can I be sure it's not a trap? Come on home with me where we can talk in private, Sam. If, if it is you... And if I did, could I be sure that wasn't a trap? What do you have to fear from me? Only your fear of me. Because I can unmask you for what you are. Sam, in the name of heaven, it's dead and gone 20 years or so ago. Can we let it rest? Oh, Let's go back and discuss it. It's too open here. All right, Henry. But just remember, I am armed. One false move and you could be dead. Ah, uh, I'll take my chances. As I have uh, coming to this meeting. If you wanted to kill me, you could easily have done so by now. I don't want to kill you, Henry. I want you to kill yourself. Like all the others. I am not here to exact vengeance. Only to accomplish retribution. And you really expect me to believe the incredible story you told me while we were driving home? I'm quite sure you believe me. You are serious. Trying to convince me that everyone who was there that night is dead. Except you and me. Well, I knew about Red Fulbus with a cancer and Butsy Stella and Korea and Skinny Ellis with a tuberculosis. I reckon you could say they died natural deaths. Well, what else would you say? I'd say God took them in his own time. The others I took for him. Now, I read the copies of the newspaper clippings you sent me. I thought they took their own lives. Mostly they did, except Arnie Jensen. He didn't have the guts to pull the trigger, so I helped him step off his terrace 14 floors up. The hell you did. Just who are you, Sam Small, to set yourself up as judge and executioner? The way I see it, Henry, I'm neither. I'm only your conscience. And what right have you to be there? You all made me what I am. I didn't ask to be part of what you did. I begged you not to do it. But you made me part of your sin and tarred me with the same guilty secret all of you had to bear. It broke me, the innocent one, first and ended my marriage and my home. And in the end, I came to see the only reason I had left to keep on living was to make all of you pay the same price you made poor Jim Young pay. You had to give your own lives. Uh, you must be mad. Jim Young is dead and buried and forgotten. He only got what was coming to he him. He had no trial. He didn't need one. The evidence was in. And automatically, he was guilty. Well, you doubt Carrie Sue Griffith's word? When she cried rape against my friend Jim Young, yes. Will you forget it? The past is dead. Oh, no, it ain't, Henry. I've been spending the last years making time wind up 
and all the hens come home to roost. So I'm bringing you a present like I brought all the rest. I'm giving you this gun. <laughs> Why, thank you, Sam. Now the tables are turned. I could shoot you down like the dog you are. You want to stain your soul twice? I don't think you dare. But you can go ahead if you want. I'm only living on borrowed time. I've been dead ever since the night you and your kind forced me to be part of the crime you committed. I'm offering you your only salvation. The way out everyone else took. If you don't want it, it's your own damnation. You can roast in hell for the rest of all eternity if you pull that trigger and send me to join Jim Young. Damn it, he was a black man. And I'm white? You think there's any difference in what color you kill? You're guilty just the same before the Lord. I turned and walked out of the room, leaving him with the drink in his hand, looking down at the gun. I was half blind, and at last it was all over, and I could go seek my own peace. I nearly stumbled over Beth Ann when she stopped me just before the outside door. Sam! Beth Ann? I heard. I'm sorry you did. I'm ashamed for the both of us. I should have known all those years ago. Maybe I should have told you. I didn't know how. Oh, how could I ever have married him after you? If it helps any, I hated him for years. I, I, I just didn't know how to bust loose. And how about Chrissy? Oh, no worry about her. She's safe, married with a fine boy. And she's got your grandchildren. Sure would have liked to see them. Oh, why can't you? No way. I gave them up with everything else that night. Sam? What? Don't trust Henry. He doesn't have any conscience. I'm his conscience, Beth Ann. He knows now he ain't got anything else as long as I'm alive. Because I can open up the truth and it will pull him down. But he could kill you. If he does, he kills his only hope for salvation. You're sure you want to make this statement, Mrs. Martin? I'm quite sure, Captain. You followed your husband to this address without his knowledge. You were on the floor below when the deceased Sam Small opened his door. You heard the conversation you have reported to me. I did, Captain Truff. You had climbed as far as the floor below the top floor when you heard... Who is it? Telegram from Mr. Sam Small. You didn't have to play any tricks, Henry. You want to come in? No. I want to get out. And this is the way. Then what happened, Mrs. Martin? I crouched on the landing below, not knowing what to do. No one else in the building was stirring. And then I climbed the stairs slowly to Sam's floor, and I listened at the door. There were sounds of things being overturned, bangings, scrapings, I don't know what. And then, suddenly, the door to the apartment was flung open with me hidden behind it, and my husband, Henry Martin, ran out and down the stairs as if all hell were after him. Did you go into the apartment? No, I couldn't. See, the door to the apartment had locked. But I could smell that a gun had been fired. Well, I couldn't force my way in. So you ran? Yes. Dropping one of your husband's handkerchiefs that you had borrowed as you did. Well, I suppose so. I must have. Will you arrest him now? On what evidence? It's highly circumstantial, Mrs. Martin. And on top of that, a wife cannot testify against her husband. You don't believe me? Of course I do. But you can't think I'm guilty. Oh, Captain. To understand, you would have to have lived in Borden all those years ago. Everyone on edge, uptight, fired by fear of a race riot. The beginning of the 60s. Any torch could light an explosion. Borden was a small town. And the Griffiths' wedding was a mighty special event. So when Carrie Sue cried rape, who do you think was going to be blamed? Nobody any color this side a light tan. Everybody was roaring drunk, and poor black Jim Young was the one they chose to crucify. And Henry was the leading law and order man. He rounded up the lynch mob. They wanted a real neat hanging. 
So when they stopped for gas at Sam Small's place, they roped him into it so he'd bring his open truck. You see, that's a mighty good place for someone with a noose around his neck to stand before they drive it off and leave you swinging in the breeze. It was something poor Sam wanted no part of, but they forced him into it and they threatened they'd kill me and Chrissy, too, if, if anyone else talked. You knew about this, man? Oh, well, of course not. Not then. It was a secret buried as deep as Jim Young's body, but I know it now. Like I said, ma'am, a wife cannot testify against her husband. Then let us go home and see if he won't testify against himself. Henry? It's me, Beth. Yes, I've been expecting you. Are the police with you? Yes. That's too bad. We might have had a more intimate farewell. Oh, the, the, the ch check him, Rico. Are you all right, Mrs. Martin? I'll manage. Don't let her come in, Captain. In the temple. He's gone. Oh. I'm sorry. No, I'm not. It's perhaps the one decent thing he's ever done. Life is a vital force which can create and which can destroy. Too often it is occupied with tragedy. Our story swept away the ordinary business of living and lifted a curtain on some people whose lives were scarred and doomed in a way I hope none of you may ever have to face. I'll be back shortly. Time after time, you come to my sanctum seeking stories living vicariously the life of other people, or simply settling back and enjoying a good yarn. You may be amused, thrilled, scared, appalled, each by turn. I cannot promise you what tale will come your way when you knock on my door. You take your own chances every time the door creaks open. Like Pandora's box, you never know what will fly out? Our cast included Mason Adams, Howard Ross, Bob Caliban, and Marion Seldes. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.